I've said it many times, I know I would change my ways, I know for sure When all the crows decide to meet They settle down beneath my feet I've got it right and I got it wrong But I learned my lesson hanging on Come sit here with me by the fire And let it go for a little while So be here as the night starts falling Let my fingers walk over your head Nothing to be scared of I'd rather be with you than by myself Now always in your head Paul, are you there? No, I'm here! Oh, there it is, Paul Curley. We're doing another Whiskey Fireside Chat because we're locked down once again because of COVID. So cheers. We have Paul Curley in the house. I'm here. Cheers. Good health. Hey. Slange. Ooh. What are you having? I, it's, it's something of a kind of, you know, mem memory lane on our spay trip. I'm having a Craig and Moore 12. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. I, I, I know it's only a 10 year old, but you know, I'm trying this one. Talisker is always good. Yeah. Great West Coast whiskey. One of my favorites too. I'm having a bit of, well, the ice is melting now, but I had a bit of water ice in there because it's, it's only uh, midday. You're in the evening where you are. You're, yeah, it's a respectable hour here. It's after it's it's getting on for eight o'clock, so yeah. we are fine to. But we are talking about axes, so I will probably, you know, not have very much. You know, if I've got blades out, I don't want to be, you oh. know, tipsy. This is exciting because like um, I, I did all the whiskey chats in the first lockdown. I'm doing some more because we're locked down here again in Ontario, and uh, I, I thought should I repeat myself and actually ask someone else I've already interviewed. But I said, hey, Paul Curley, yes, absolutely. Why? You have a book? Who you have a published author? Well, it yes. Um I have I have this. Oh Wilderness Act Skills and Campcraft. It's 200 pages long, man. Yeah, I know. Like, did you, you think that you could actually write a book of 200 plus pages on axes, saws, and knives? Well. It was a struggle. Do you, do you know why? Because we had to cut so much material out. <laughs> so my, I probably shouldn't say this, but hey, you've, you, I've had some whiskey now, so I get a bit more candid, right? Um, so when I got my book contract, and we, we you know, we kind of, I, I'm not that experienced in book contracts and things, but anyway, so I get the book contract and in there, it says, you know, minimum of 40,000 words. Um, I think the original page count was 192 pages. Um, so it's a minimum of 40,000 words and a minimum of, I can't remember, maybe 150 photos, 200 photos, something like that. So when I delivered 60,000 words and 900 photos, <laughs> um, they were like, that's too much. And I'm like, well, you didn't give me a maximum. And I know there's a page count, but what the hell do I know about making books? I've not written one before. So it's nice to see it come to fruition. Yeah, it's it's actually about time. I, I, I knew that you should always have written a book um, because you had this information locked up in here and just needs to be spilled out onto a page. And yeah. when I looked at the book, I, that's absolutely what it is. It's an incredible view. I, mean, I If I went up to someone on the street and said, yeah, this guy, Paul Curley, he wrote a book on axes, knives, and craft work. And they're like, whoa, yeah, whoa. I went, no, no, it's really good. Did it take you like five years to write this or six or seven or, or a half um, year? Or? From, from when I was first contacted about it to now is like three and a bit years, but it didn't take me that long to write. But in a way, it took me more than 10 years to write it because... I couldn't have done it without all the photos that I had from the various wilderness trips, from the programs that we teach in the woods, from just, just the application of the skills. And that's, that's where the book comes from. It doesn't come from just a, 
a kind of theoretical oh here's a rehash of stuff it's like this is what we i find useful my colleagues find useful um and let's get it in a book and it's based on you know a lot of experience um of just applying the stuff and and teaching it and seeing what people find useful i mean and you, you know that just as well as anybody that there's a feedback loop there with teaching in terms of you teach stuff and you see what people respond to and what they find useful and there's a kind of filter there and that feeds back to you one way or another and you think well this is this is the core of what we should be sharing and so that's been an important part of of producing this as well and um, because i've been teaching bushcraft since 2003 um just that experience of sharing the skills how to share the skills how to explain them to people safely how to get people up the learning curve so that they could go and use these things and what's the core stuff that they find useful when they go and apply things for themselves that's all fed back into this project as well so in a way it's taken more than 10 years to write because i couldn't have done it without that experience beforehand so yeah, that's, that's an incredible answer. I, that, let, let's look into the book. I mean, the first mm -hmm. chapter, I'm going to read it right here. It's called Selecting the Correct Tools for the Job. Yeah. You, you talk about axe types. Now, okay, so I've got three axes here. Do you, do you have any axes? I do. Oh. Every man should have at least one axe next to his desk, I think. Uh, I think. Paul, every person should have. Every person, yes. yes. All right. <laughs> So, so how do you cut do that it? bit out? <laughs> I, I'll edit that piece out, Paul. But isn't an axe just an axe? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of different types, and I don't have that many. So, I don't have any splitting axes in my office. But you know, that's one axe that maybe many people are familiar with from the woodshed. You know, in their cabin, in their cottage, out the back, in their backyard for their wood burner splitting axes and they're they're a specialist axe right and you wouldn't probably try and carve a spoon with a, a felling axe and a splitting axe and you wouldn't fell a tree with a splitting axe um and so there's one answer is that okay there's one very obvious specialist axe which is a splitting axe and then you've got carving axes so um you know, like this lovely little one from uh, Julia Kaltoff in, in Sweden. No connection other than I, I met her and I like her work. And I, I bought this from her last year and I didn't get much chance to use it until now. And it's like some other carving axes I've got, but it's a little smaller. But one of the things you'll notice with a carving axe, we kind of started back backwards first here because we haven't looked at general purpose axes, but a lot of people might be familiar with general purpose axes. It's got quite a short handle and it's got quite a long edge to it and it's quite curved because and the balance points about there and it's all about that kind of if you pardon the phrase that wrist action you know you're kind of slicing with with that length there particularly when you're working green wood it's like when you use your knife if you try and force the knife through the wood it doesn't go but if you slice as you push you get a nice shaving and it's the same with a carving axe so you've got quite a short stubby axe with quite a heavy head it's heavier than a than a hatchet so the gravity does the work for you and you've got that slicing action. So that's that's something that you if you were doing a lot of carving, like you were making utensils and, you know, green woodworking and stuff, that would be something that you'd have to do that because it's more efficient than a general purpose axe. Um, so there's two kind of very obvious categories of axes that are not just an axe, but I guess the axes that most people will be familiar with are the kind of more general purpose axes. And this type of axe has become much more popular in recent years. The, the old school guys, you know, the, the kind of gruff guys out in the, you know, the prospectors and stuff of the old days would probably call that a, a, a boy's axe, you know, in a derogatory sense um, because it's quite small, but these half axes as you might call them because I won't fit on the screen, but it's about half it's about half the length of a full size felling axe, but it's also about half the length from my fingertips to my sternum. So is that a boy's axe? Are you a boy? I'm a man, man. Well, there you go. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a full grown person's axe. Yeah. Oh, but it's just but it's just a small compact one that's very portable, which is why we like them. 
yeah, you can put that in a day pack. Um, it's not too heavy. It's got a 700 gram head. Um, it's easy to look after. It's It can be used one handed like the carving axe. You know, you've got that balance point there. So you can you can do some carving. I'll take the mask off and try not to chop my microphone in half. Um, you know, but it's you can see it's got a shorter edge and it's not quite as curved and it's quite a, a fine bit as well. So it's definitely not a splitting axe. It's definitely not a carving axe. It's a general purpose axe, but you can use it. You can strangle it a bit and use it like a carving axe. Um, and it's just big enough that you can use it two handed. So you could fell small trees with this. You can split reasonably sized firewood, particularly if you've got some extra techniques at your disposal. And it's, you know, it doesn't weigh more than about a kilogram. So it's quite a light axe, but it's very wieldy and it's very um, versatile, which is why they're really popular. You know, so I think, you know, that's a good, that's, you know, for, for a general tripping axe or a general camp axe, that's really good because you can split kindling and or you can fell a tree, you can carve a spoon. Um, they're, they're great for, for all of those jobs. But are they are they the best axe for any of those jobs? Probably not, but then you don't want to take 10 axes on a trip with you. So you take a general purpose axe that's a jack of all trades, right? It's almost like the prospector of news. Like, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Now, um, so what's the difference? Like, okay, this guy. Like, woo! Right. Yeah, yeah that's a, a splitter. That's a small that splitting axe. Yeah. So if I was going on a canoe trip in the bush, you're saying this one is better than that one. Yeah, because your splitter is optimized for splitting quite chunky stuff on a block. So if you look at the width of the head, and that's not by any means the biggest splitter, but you, you can see there's more metal around the eye of the axe. That's where the, the, the handle comes through the head. And also, if Kevin was to take the masks off those, the leather masks, you'll see that the splitting axe is much more wedge shaped. Which is, so it's designed for prying the wood apart when you're splitting. Yeah. So there's more weight in the head and it's more like a wedge, whereas the general purpose axe is much finer. It's still got some weight to it, but nowhere near as much. And that's designed for limbing. You know, it will split things, but not as efficiently as the splitting axe. And the stuff that the splitting axe would handle, quite chunky stuff, knotty wood, the general purpose axe might struggle with a little bit more. Yeah. So it's horses for courses. So your canoe tripping axe is the general purpose axe and your woodshed axe, your backyard axe for splitting stuff for the for the wood burner is, is the splitting axe. So. Well, so now <laughs> this is dangerous, man. <laughs> I got she's coming up. Sharp objects. Um, all right. Now this is my winter axe. Woo! And this is more like this is not a boy's axe, I guess, eh? No, that's bigger. Yeah. Council tool. Really nice axe, actually. Oh, oh the whiskey's gone. Oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> We're gonna talk about safety with axes in a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't cover indoor safety with axes in the <laughs> So what? Well, so basically, this is like if, if you do this, what you did. This is longer, right? Yeah, it's like a three quarters, isn't it? Yeah, it's like more like this one that I've got here. Yeah, so it's a longer handle or helve, like a three quarter, and it's probably about half the most of them that are around this size are about half the weight of a full size felling axe. The head weight is about half approximately they vary but i would say that's a good approximation so it's like you know three quarters of the handle length and about half the head weight of a full-size felling axe and so you've got a lot more leverage and you've got a considerably more weight than the than the half axe and for winter that's that's good because you're probably not going to be carving and and doing as much light work and you need more firewood in the winter right so um you you need to fuel your stove if you're hot tenting and you've got to process that wood, it's a lot more than you need on a canoe trip, just with a fire for cooking or just, you know, a little campfire for morale or what have you in the winter, you need that warmth and you need plenty of firewood and you need to, you need to process it down to a size that will fit in your stove. You need a saw to go with that as well, typically, but you're chopping more and you've got fewer hours of daylight. So you need to be efficient with the job as well. So that's, 
why most of us tend to use a bigger axe for for winter camping um, like you've got there so yeah and i i'd love this part uh, uh I, I find this helps split the wood apart more uh i don't really paul i don't know any about axes you know that right so i just looks good you know i go chop wood yeah it looks good but i do like this part of it that it, it will split more because yeah. i did traditionally i would go on winter trips with those two other axes that i had because that's what i owned but then uh, the last couple of years, I got this, and this is uh, my my uh, my winter one. Yeah, so you've got you've got a, you've got an axe there with a handle that's probably about the same length as the splitter. It's got a heavier head. It's got a, an axe. It's got a head that is somewhere in between your general purpose profile and your splitting profile. It's got more weight to it, and um, it hasn't got too much weight to it. But it's got that central bit that's a bit wider as well, which will help with the splitting. But it's also got a relatively you know, hasn't got as uh, obtuse a bevel as the splitter. You know, it's still got quite an edge to it, that I'd imagine. So it's, it's a good and it's but you can see it's got more metal above where the handle attaches there as well. So it's definitely got more weight to it. So I'd imagine not having used that specific axe, I'd imagine, though, that that's a fantastic winter axe. Yeah, I really like actually. And what I love about this, it comes with a harness I wear on my back. So I, when I have my anorak on, I actually strap it over me. Mm -hmm. uh right but what what about wood uh is it ash they use or traditionally in the past they did use a lot of ash particularly over on this side of the pond ash was the traditional axe handle wood um but like you guys um in north america i suspect i mean certainly over here now most of the traditional handle the wooden handle axes are all hickory which is a North American species. It's not native to Europe. So, um, and it is, it is more resilient than ash, but that doesn't mean to say ash is bad, but one of the things with ash is that you do need to make sure that the grain is um, properly aligned um, more so than you do with hickory actually. So ash is tough and flexible, and that's what you want for a wood, for an ax handle. You know, it makes a good tool handle, yeah. Like you, you cover saws in this chapter, right? Um, mm -hmm. Do you? Yes. Yep. Yeah, you do. You talk about all different saws. So uh, I, isn't there just one blade? Well, this th if you want to just talk wood, there's two saw blades that you should be aware of. There's the kind of saw blade that if you ask a child to draw a saw blade, they probably would. You know, it's just like a zigzag of teeth, of regular teeth along the saw. They're symmetrical. They're kind of triangular. Um, and those are very good for um, seasoned wood, you know, dead wood, wood that doesn't have a lot of moisture in it. Um, and that's the type of stuff you're going to be using on your um, on your winter camping trips. Right. You, you're probably not going to be cutting green wood. You're going to be largely cutting uh, dead standing wood for fuel. And so you want a saw that's optimized for that. But if you're using a saw blade, for, for more jobs and sometimes you're cutting green wood sometimes you're cutting dead wood then you want a saw blade that's a little bit more able to cope with the green wood because the problem with green wood is that it can be quite sticky the sawdust can be sticky because of the moisture and because of the sap and so a, a green wood saw blade has what's called raker teeth so they're like little curved teeth that a little bit like you getting your finger in there and scooping out the sawdust that's what those raker teeth do. And I've already spotted on that saw that you've got there, Kevin, if you can get it together. I don't know what you're doing with it down there, wrestling with it. You've got it tangled in your shoelaces or something, I think. I do. I'm trying to be safe. <laughs> All right, here we go. Now, for many, many, many years, for pretty much everything, I used this. And this was made by the late, great Chris Boyton, a fantastic uh, bowyer, very knowledgeable on, on bow making. But he, you know, he was a good woodworker in general. And he made these saws. And, um, you know, this has been well, well used. Um, it's of a very traditional type. Um, some people argue that it is something specific to wood law, for example, because uh, Ray Mears uh, had Chris Boyton make these. But if you just look back in museums and old books and old black and white documentaries, and you see this type of saw all the time. <laughs> yeah, so you can see there, you've got, for example, you've got four regular teeth 
And then you've got like that scoop tooth. There's like a little kind of shell shape and it comes back on itself and it's symmetrical because it goes both ways, right? So you've got four regular teeth and then there are a couple of raker teeth that are opposing each other so that it scoops out the, the cut and it's less likely to bind. But there are fewer teeth over the overall length of the saw blade than if they were just regular teeth. So if you weren't cutting green wood and you wanted to optimize for, for seasoned wood, you'd be better off with a, a saw blade that just had the regular teeth. But if yeah. you're doing everything or just green wood, you need a, a blade like Kevin's got on his, on his saw there. So uh, do you, can you sharpen your saw blades? You can, and there are old school ways of doing it. I haven't covered that in my book because frankly, most people these days are not prepared to do that. Um, you know, the type of the type of um, saw that you've got there probably takes a standard Barco 24 inch um, blade. They're about five pounds, you know, probably about ten dollars. People aren't going to spend ages sharpening their saws. Back in the day, though, when people were using big crosscut saws, of course, they were expensive and they were more like the axe. It was something you invested in. And, yeah, there were ways of filing the teeth to make sure that they uh, were kept sharp. But most people are not going to want to sharpen their saw blades these days. And that's the world we live in. And, um, you know, I haven't, I don't think it's an essential thing for people to be able to, is, is it an interesting thing for people to understand at some point? If they really want to get into the tool maintenance. Yeah, absolutely. Whole books have been written on sharpening tools. So, you know, there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge. Seriously. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to recommend other people's books. I've got a, I've got quite a big hardback book just on sharpening tools somewhere here. Um, I've got an old axe book as well. That's got a whole section on sharpening crosscut saws and things. And yeah, it's a whole level of expertise there that most people don't even know exists. So when, yeah. when you, uh, when you first met your, uh, your uh, life partner, um, it was that the first date you showed her all the, uh, those books you have. Show that show to my sharpening books. Ooh. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm not shy of the fact that I've read a lot and, you know, the, the kind of critics out there will go, oh, you've, you know, people always see things as mutually exclusive. They think if you've read lots, that means you haven't done lots, but you can have done lots and read lots. And I think the people that have done both have probably got more, um, more synthesis of practicality. And, you know, there's a lot of useful knowledge locked up in some of the old manuals and books and even just accounts of journeys and things and that stuff would have been lost if it wasn't written in books and it would be lost if people didn't read those books and then it's incumbent upon those of us that are interested in the outdoors to go and apply it you know so i, I trip with you paul you know exactly what you're doing yes. uh, i, d I <laughs> did you. learn that uh, though the first night on trip was not to go near your axes and saws well, there is an old saying, and I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but they, I read somewhere that the old, you know, woodsmen, the old, particularly the foresters would say they, they, they would lend you their wife sooner than they'd lend you their axe. You know, um, it's, a, it's probably a little bit distasteful now as a, as a point, but you know, th they were important, they were very important tools. And um, just more generally, I mean, you probably know from having, you know, led groups in the outdoors, Kevin, that people just don't look after your stuff in the same way as you look after it yourself. Every time I lend something to somebody, you know, little saws come back with the tips broken off. I lent a carving knife to somebody once the tip came back broken off. I'm just like, I'm not lending things to people. And I've, I've always been like that with my axes, because if you, if you chip if you chip a, an ax on a trip, it's a real pig to, to get the chip out of it. And the other thing as well, it's not that I don't trust you, but the other issue with axes, of course, is that you might know what you're doing with it, but the person who's borrowing it might not. And you've got no real way of assessing that if you haven't seen them use an ax before. So just from that perspective, I, I'm very reticent to lend anybody an ax. Even when we've got group axes for students to use, in a very limited capacity perhaps on some programs if it's just one thing they need to do like split wood to go into a stove um i make sure they know how to do it safely before any of them are let loose so there's there's a number of reasons around the axe kind of protectiveness but equally i've refinished the handle on on mine and it took me 
hours and hours and days, you know, hours over the number of days, you know, lovely gunstock finish on the axe handles and I'm, I'm protective of them, you know? So. I, I totally agree with you. I, I, I actually graduated from forestry uh, at the college. So, uh, you know, um, that was years ago, back in the eighties, but I worked in forestry for many years and nobody went near anybody's chainsaw or ax mm. or whatever. It, it, it was a known. Um, and when I'm on trip uh, and, and, and when I used to guide too, the people that would ask, no, they wouldn't ask. They would just grab your, your axe and start chopping. Then I wouldn't trust them because if they didn't know that rule, then they weren't skilled yeah. at, at that. Yeah. And it, it was sort of a red flag. As soon as someone picks your axe up, they're going to have an injury. So going back to sawing, is there a technique that is, uh, you know, makes it easier? Well, we got one piece cut. Oh, this is Kevin Callen's version of bushcraft. Well, there's a couple. There's a couple of tips. In the first one, you know, and this is based on seeing people pick saws up and seeing how they use them naturally. And there's always a couple of things that often you see that just could make life easier. First one is using the full length of the saw blade, right? People pick up like a 24 inch or a 30 inch saw and they use the central third. They're like, because they're cutting a small piece of wood or something, right? And they're like, they kind of proportion the saw stroke to the size of wood they're cutting. It's like, no, just use the full length of the blade and you'll get through it quicker. Use all the teeth, right? So that's one thing that's just makes life easier. But then the other thing I see people doing a lot, and it's hard for me to demonstrate it here, but um, say this is a log, this is a saw case, but say this is a log, what they'll do is they'll prop that up against a stump or something and that's on the ground and then they'll start sawing here. And just basic kind of mechanics means that that cut that they're creating wants to close. As this becomes more flexible, as they cut more material away from it, that, that cut will pinch the saw. And you see people all the time struggling with that. So if you just place it on the log rather than against the log and maybe put your knee on it and saw it so that gravity is pulling that side down, it's going to open the cut. And so that's going to work to your advantage. And you can even put your knee on that and push that with your hand if you want. There's a technique where, and I teach this to start off a cut, saws will rove around a little bit. So if you've got a log and you put the saw blade on and you start cutting, before it's established the cut, it can rove around and you don't want it roving onto your finger, right? So what I teach people to do is where you've got the saw frame is just put your hand through, you know, you've got that aperture in the middle. So I can show it here. It's probably easier to show. I've got one of these little folding saws. It's a 21 inch, but it, it's big enough to show the technique. Let's see if I can manage to Wait, they're made in Ontario. They are. That's yeah, the Agua saw, is it? Yeah. Oh, cool. I really like those for that's kind of become my preferred canoe tripping saw because it's tough. Um, doesn't really matter if it gets wet on any given day. I mean, clearly you don't want it sitting in water forever, but unlike a wooden saw where I, I really like the traditional wooden box saws like you've got I've got one here as well but I tend to just use mine for winter camping now because wood's really good even with gloves on it's not very conductive compared to metal or plastic some plastics and so I like this for for, for canoeing um, because it's tough and it doesn't matter if it gets wet um, I stick it in one of these little frost river slips which fit really nicely um, but this technique I'm talking about is like you can put your hand there on the log and start sawing and you might rove onto your own hand. But if you put your hand through and hold and hold the log, you can't cut yourself with the blade. You can't jump onto your own hand. And also you can start to push that open if you need to. And then once it's established, you can take your hand out again. But it's well illustrated in the book. And that's a simple safety technique because saws are very safe to use generally. It's hard to really seriously injure yourself with a bow saw or a buck saw. But one of the things that people sometimes do absentmindedly is rove it onto their fingers when they're starting the cut. So just putting your hand through, that's good. Making sure that that opens rather than closes on the blade is a big one. And just using the full length of the blade rather than that, that all makes life a lot easier. And um, if you if you partner up with somebody 
axes and knives are really good down the grain for splitting, for carving, for shaving. They're much less efficient across the grain. You can work across the grain with axes, but you waste a lot of material and you waste energy. Whereas a saw, you're going to make a cut that's a couple of millimeters wide. You waste very little material. Um, the, cu the cut's very controlled. You end up with something that's got a flat end, which is important if you want to put it on a stump for chopping or what have you, or you want to efficiently fit it into your stove. So like you might carry a small folding saw with your belt knife, I think carrying a, a, a bigger saw with an ax makes perfect sense because they go together so well. You know, uh, Paul, Paul, um, uh, this book could have been like 600 pages. Okay. I know, I know. Because <laughs> we're only on chapter one. <laughs> we are doing six of these chats, aren't we, Kevin? Oh, I don't know about that. I'm running out of whiskey, but I... <laughs> All right. but getting but getting the right tools in the first place is important. And and frankly, I think in terms of people watching this, that's probably where they're going to want to start. Right. You know, they want to get the right tools, especially the general purpose tools so they can do they can do more. But I think we also need to talk a little bit about ethics as well, because I I saw. Uh, I saw Cliff Jacobson post something just the other day, may even been today. I can't remember um, about you know, a great, lovely pine tree being sawn down in a, in a, in a national park. I think it might've been superior um, uh, national forest. Waters. or something. There's boundary waters. Yeah. Um, and I've seen similar things on canoe routes. I'm sure you've seen similar things and it's all well and good having these tools, but it doesn't mean to say you just start lopping everything down. I mean, that they're, they're a tool. They're there to be used when you need them. You don't have to use them for the sake of it. And we've talked about, we had a bit of a chat about that whole shelter building thing, cutting green material. And I've had, I posted your article and then I've had people interview me about your article. You know, it's just, um, this you know dare we say it this fake bushcraft thing and I, but i do think it's important because i think people get fixated you know they, they get fixated on the tools and then they want to use them um and i think you have to have some responsibility um and you know i i do take a folding saw like i just showed you and a half axe on a canoe on a wilderness canoe trip but you know it's largely, you know, if, if, if you need to clear a portage, but in some, in many places you don't because they're so well used, the trails are, you know, well used. Um, you, maybe you need to process a bit of firewood. Um, and that's often more of an issue in well used places than wilderness, real wilderness areas. Um, so for example, when I did a solo trip on the Barrens, I don't think I, I took an ax and a saw and I don't think I used the saw a little bit just to process some medium sized firewood. I used the axe a touch, but it was only small, like again, splitting kindling, making feather sticks or just splitting out some kindling. But most of the time, just take, you can just take some spruce twigs, right? And light your fire that way if you're going to have a fire at all. But it's when you get to areas where all, you know, you have to camp on a particular camping spot and all those spruce twigs or, you know, whatever have already gone, then maybe you need to split some kindling out. Um, so for me, it's just a way of being efficient. It, you know, I think I, on all my canoe trips in Canada, I think I've taken down one tree ever. And that was because it was overhanging a campsite and it was unsafe. Um, you know, it was dead and it was half over um, about 60 degrees and it was overhanging the main kind of fire site. So I wasn't just doing myself a favor. I was doing some other people a favor, but it, you know, and we, we kind of had got there quite late and it was kind of like, we kind of need to camp here. So other than that, I don't use them. I use it a lot more in the winter because of the fuel issue. Right. But in terms of tripping, you hardly ever really need to use these tools very much, but they're good to have in case you do. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I found with that piece that I wrote about uh, big bushcrafters, um, that a lot of bushcrafters loved it. In fact, 99.9% .9 of comments came back. The negative comments that came back, uh, very very few actually, um, didn't read the article. No. Yeah, the article was about fake bushcrafting. It had nothing to do with. Yeah. Not so. And I and I think I think you're right. People didn't make the, the 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 delineation that you were making. They didn't pick up on that. And I think the other thing as well, there were a f I saw a few comments from non Canadians 
And I think also there's a lack of understanding of the park system. Like, I, you know, that th there's all this, there's, there's crown land and then there's provincial parks. I think the fact, if you don't understand the context that you're talking about either, that that doesn't help the fact that people think you're just ranting about bushcraft and you're not, you're, you know, you're talking about somewhere like Algonquin where it's well, it's heavily used. It's, it needs to be managed carefully and you don't want people just going on to the regular campsites and, and cutting green wood because it's just not appropriate. Yeah. It's just on any level. Yeah. Yeah. There's just way too many people using the resource. And you just can't have yeah. that. Right. So, no. I mean, yeah, it's like yeah. people it's like people walking the Appalachian Trail. You need to treat you need to treat where you camp on the Appalachian Trail very differently than if you were just doing a random hike somewhere in the woods because of the of the amount of use that it gets. Yeah, yeah. Especially yeah. now, there's a lot more people out there too. All yeah. right. So how do I be safe with an axe? That's a big question. Because yeah. it could be very dangerous. If you get an axe wound, you probably get helicoptered out. Yeah, and that's the thing. I don't think they you know. Other things being equal, I don't think the likelihood of an axe injury is particularly higher than a knife injury. But the problem is it's the severity of the wound that is more uh, significant with an axe. I mean, fundamentally, it's designed to take chunks out of wood more rapidly and more effectively than a knife. And so it's going to take chunks out of you more effectively and more rapidly than a knife. Right. And that's the thing. That's the first thing to remember. Um, um, I think as well always it's like it goes back to the same with knives like where is it going to go next right that's the first thing you need to think about people people who injure themselves often don't think about the range of outcomes for what they're doing they just think about the outcome of what they're doing of what they're trying to achieve and they don't think about what could go wrong here and um, good education helps you shortcut some of those questions but just having just being a bit questioning about okay if if this doesn't go where if i miss the thing i'm trying to split or um if it if it goes too far or if it falls short or you know just some basic where could it go and what could happen and where would the axe go if that were to happen and make sure it's not me as a as a general kind of thought that that's how it, and that's a bit vague so let's talk about some specifics so if if you're using a half axe, right, where that's going to hit you is in the knee because of the length of the handle. If you miss something and you're standing up and it continues on an arc, you'll hit yourself in the knee somewhere or maybe just the top of your shin if you've got really short thighs, but you'll hit yourself in the middle of the leg. Um, and that's just, that's, that's part of, the specification of the axe that's doing that yeah if you were using a longer axe you'd hit yourself lower in the leg but one of the things you can do to make a half axe which is one of the more popular sizes one of the things you can do to make that super safe is kneel down when you're using it because then you can't hit yourself you hit the ground before you hit yourself in the leg right so that's something that you know, I think is worth thinking about under most circumstances from splitting kindling to splitting firewood to felling trees. If you're using that, you can kneel down while you're doing it and it makes it inherently a lot safer. If I'm working on a stump, I'm splitting something and I miss, as I say, Nika. As soon as I kneel down, if I miss, I'm hitting the ground. I don't want to hit the ground with my axe. There's bits of grit and stone and whatnot in there i'm going to blunt in it but it's better than blunting it on myself um then you get onto some of the common things that you see people doing like they've got a stump and they put a piece of wood on it and they put the piece of wood really close to, to the to the front edge of the the stump also if i'm working on splitting something if i'm standing while i'm neat standing a piece of wood here i'm better off putting it there because then if I miss it, I'm going to hit the, this bit first rather than standing it here, trying to split it, missing it, and it coming towards me. That makes a big difference. Um, if you're carving, so, sort of have the follow, don't be, don't be doing it right in front of you. Again, if you're on a stump, the follow through is towards your leg. 
work here so the follow through i'm doing it i'm not i wouldn't work like that it's just that the camera's there but have the follow through to the side of your body right that's you know so just working on a stump put the piece if you're splitting it on the back think about where the follow through is um, but then you get that thing where you see people, they can't balance the log on the top and they hold it. And then they're the playing chicken with their hands. That just gives me the creeps. Yeah. Because I've seen so many photos on, on Facebook groups and the like of people where that's gone wrong. And it's, you know, big gashes here, you know, like, like imagine a piece of steak with it and you cut it with a sharp steak knife. Yeah. That immediately on the back of your hand. Right. You don't want that out in the bush. You don't want that out on a trip. You've got all manner of ligaments and nerves and things going on here. Some of it is really difficult to fix. I mean, modern medical science is fantastic, but putting an ax in here is not good. Yeah. So um, if you can't balance it, don't, don't do this chicken thing. And again, you see some people doing amazing things with axes on Instagram, you know, all sorts of crazy splitting and, but that's, that's not what you do if you want to be safe for most people. Yeah. So balance it, put it, split it. Another thing you see people doing is they'll, they'll size up with their elbows quite close in for splitting and then they'll go to split and they'll extend and they'll, they'll miss what they're trying to split and they'll hit there, which damages the ax, which isn't good. It doesn't split the wood either, which is not helpful, but it can damage the ax. You get overstrike damage here. But I've seen a few, I've never seen it in practice, but I've seen a couple of videos where the, the combination of the springiness of the handle and whatever the wood that they were trying to split was, is that it's bounced back and they've hit themselves in the face with the pole, uh, the back of the ax here. So that's another safety point. So make sure you size things up properly because it's you know efficient, but also in extremists, things could bounce back. So think about the ax bouncing off things and thinking about, think about it continuing through, where's it gonna go next? And make sure that isn't you in either case. Yeah, so those are sort of some specific examples of, you know, some common, common situations where people are splitting on stumps. Um, there's a really uh, safe kindling splitting technique that um, I learned many years ago and I try and share it with as many people as possible. And I possibly showed it to you when we did the spay trip. If you can hold what you're trying to split in one hand, you're better off rather than trying to balance it on a stump, like a chopping block, which you may not have in a wilderness situation anyway. Some campsites might have something that's been left from forestry or someone's left a stump or maybe even just a tree that's been cut and people use that for splitting but most of the time you're not going to have a chopping block and on the canadian shield you've got all that rock to worry about as well right that's just going to take chunks out of your axe if you if you try and split straight onto it so this this works for many reasons and basically if you can hold the piece so you've got a nice piece of cedar or a bit of pine or something a bit of little bit of white pine or a bit of white uh, eastern white cedar or something that will split nicely for for kindling or even some poplar, right? Some balsam poplar or something. Um, hold it in your hand. Um, if you've sawed it to about the length of your axe, it will then basically meet the axe at the at the head and at the handle, and you can hold it, hold the piece there, gently tap that onto just literally a small log. So you can put a small log on the ground, on the rock, on the on the earth. That's all you need to then split you hold the piece and the ax together and you gently tap them until the ax just makes its way into the wood a little bit. And then you tap it more and it's amazing. It just plop, it'll split in half. And then you've got two halves and then you can do that with that. You've got your quarters. Maybe you go down to eights. Maybe you then want to do feather sticks or split some of them down more for kindling. And it's really efficient. It's not very dynamic, which means it's safe to use quite close to other people. So you could be, you know, you and I could be near a campfire and you could be starting the fire and I could be splitting stuff and just passing it across to, you know, I'm not wildly swinging an ax around and bits of wood flying everywhere. It's really safe and simple. And frankly, that's all most people need to split to get, you know, they need to split stuff to get a fire going. They might need the quarters for their kind of next level few, you know, when we light a fire, we say sort of matchstick thin and then 
pencil thickness and then thumb thickness and, and then, you know, like wrist thickness or whatever. And most fires you ever have, unless you're in a really cold situation, you don't really need anything that's bigger than wrist thickness, right? So you probably can hold the pieces you've got, split down the ones you need to get your fire established. So you can go from fine to medium and so on. And then that's all the ax work you need to do. So I, I really like that as a kind of core ax technique because you need no chopping block sorts out most of the fuel that you need from most campfires if you can't find kindling and it's super safe to use around other people and for yourself so and you can do it kneeling down so and it works brilliantly with these axes it doesn't work so well with the three-quarter axe but with these half axes it's fantastic so that would be one of the key things i'd say learn that technique um you don't even need to buy my book to get that technique it's actually on my, it's actually on my website so um you know, you, you know, I'm not even trying to sell you the book by telling you that just learn that technique. It's really useful and it's super safe. So, well, I mean, and, and that's chapter two still. <laughs> um, the one thing you, you did show too, uh, I found it really interesting. The old, uh, cause I wasn't sure if I was doing it proper or should even do it. But when you get a big chunk of wood, let's say you were even at the cabin, you know, at a campsite, mm -hmm. the idea of actually you putting the ax in the wood and then putting it over your shoulder and hitting uh, your chopping block with the the uh, back of the axe to split the wood. Is that mm -hmm. proper procedure or is that just craziness? Well, to me, it's proper procedure, but you do, there's a couple of safety points. But fundamentally, like if you've got a piece of wood that's hard to split and you're not using a, I mean, you can, you, you can do it with a splitting axe. You know, so you're at the cabin, it will work with a splitting axe as well, but even more so if you're using a general purpose axe, because remember the general purpose axe heads are not that heavy. Like the, the, the half axe and the three quarter axe heads are not super heavy. So gravity will do a certain amount. And if your axe is sharp, that's great. But the log you're trying to split is almost certainly a lot heavier than the axe head. So this is not beyond the capability of this small axe that a lot of you carry. Stuck. I'm not doing that. Okay. Remember, I can lift from there. Lifting from there. Very difficult. Lifting from here onto my shoulder. Drop. So simply by inverting the the, the mechanics of it by dropping a heavy weight of wood onto the axe head you're letting gravity work more in your favor for starters. You're letting that momentum work for you because it's the same ax head, it's the same edge, it's the same head, but you're applying more force to it because you've inverted the thing. And so that's one of the reasons it works really well. But there's a couple of points. It needs to, it works best if the whole thing comes down vertically. So the ax head comes down vertically and the wood comes down vertically. If you kind of throw it, it's on more of a circular path. And what tends to happen is the ax head hits and then the log kind of flips off the, off the bit. You, it's much more efficient if it all bangs down on top of each other, right? So that's the first thing. So when you bring it down, rather than kind of doing that, you kind of almost need to bend your knees, if, if depending on the height of the block, but you need to make sure that the whole lot comes down vertically because then it's more likely to work. The other thing you need to be careful about is when you pick it up, so you've got a log, you've embedded your ax in it, and now you're picking the whole thing up. You need quite a lot of force there, right, to pick the whole thing off. If the ax comes out of the wood, you've all of a sudden got something which is much lighter, and it's going to come towards your face if you're, if you're not careful, right? Because you're, you're pulling on the handle that all of a sudden doesn't have the resistance on it, and it's going to move towards you. So when you pick it up, let me get the three quarters for this, okay? When you pick it up, so that's embedded in a log, right? Rather than picking it up towards your face like this, because if it comes, if the log falls off, you'll just smack yourself. What, and it's actually more efficient as well. You want to pick it up and then do it this way. Bring your elbow in. So that's putting a lot of leverage on your shoulders and your wrist out there, right? And if you try and pick something up there, it's hard work, right? So what you want to do is pick it off the block and then bring it to here because then you're not levering it towards your face and also you're putting much less stress on your wrist and your and your um 
and your shoulder. And then you can bring it to your shoulder quite easily, like from the block, you just get underneath it there. And now it's on your shoulder. And now you throw it off and bend your knees and you've done your technique safely and efficiently. So. Okay. So your little axe that you carry around with you a lot is very capable. Again, put the thing there, not there. There and off. Yeah. Now, do you have to have a lumber jacket on while doing it? Is that? It helps. I think, you know, you get into the mindset, you know, it's, um, but just be careful. You don't have, you know, a flappy kind of tail or anything. You don't want to get caught up in the, in some of those actions, you know, you need your shirt tucked in, I think. Probably. Okay. Okay. So, so do you spat on the ground and, and curse first for the, does, does that help as well? Or, uh, um, I don't find it does. Maybe if I chewed tobacco, it might, but I don't. So, you know, it's probably a bit superfluous, just spitting. You probably just get dehydrated over the course of a day okay. while spitting wood. It's probably not that good. So. Okay. Oh, my Lord. Another chapter, caring for your tools. First off, moisture is generally the, the, the enemy of a lot of the components of these things. The wood, the leather, the steel, it keeping them damp and soggy doesn't help so particularly given you have some canoeists in your in your audience that's something that we should all think about is you know and i think about it hard on canoe trips it's like you know you might have a nice saw and a nice axe and a canvas portage pack and you know that thing will get wet at some point even you know you're going through some you know waves on a wave train or something you get a bit of water in the bottom of your boat the canoe pack gets a bit damp then that's going into whatever's inside etc and the problem with axes as well in particular is that they're hard to pack in a dry bag because they tend to they tend to have sharp not not sharp sharp but they tend to have square enough corners on the head that they start damaging you know ort lieb and seal line bags and things so i tend not to put mine in a in a dry bag i tend to put mine if i've got like a traditional i either put it in my day pack um which is cordura typically or I'll put it in a, you know, if we've got a group kit that's got a, we've got a canvas bag, I'll, I'll put an axe in there. But you need to make sure that it's not going to suffer if it gets wet. And the main thing there is oiling the head, is making sure you've got a good amount of oil on the head, making sure that if the ma uh, that the, the mask is well protected with leather protector so it doesn't soak up a lot of moisture, just in the same way as you do with your boots, right? You know, you don't want your boots, look at that. Yeah handle wax oh, and knife wax, knife and axe, blade oil. Yeah. So stuff that will stay on reasonably well and protect it from moisture. And it isn't just, you know, moisture when it's, you know, in the water, like where I was just out in the woods teaching for a couple of weeks and we've had really quite cold nights for, for the UK for this time of year. It was getting down to freezing, getting down to zero overnight but it was quite sunny. It's spring. We're well past the equinox. We're getting into May, right? We're at the end of April. The sun's quite strong and um, quite warm during the day, but then quite cool at night. You get condensation on stuff, right? And you get condensation on metal and um, you get dew. And that is enough to start th like axes that are not stainless steel. That's enough to start them rusting, right? So just a thin layer of oil on your axe just to protect from that is good. Keep the leather in good condition. You want a non-softening leather um, treatment. So something that will waterproof it, but not soften it because you don't want it going all flobby. Um, yeah, yeah. Rub it, rub it down with whatever, yeah. Um, yeah. And there's all sorts of things. I mean, you can use traditional things. You know, people use beeswax, people use mink oil. But, you know, anything that's good for your boots, even the sort of synthetic kind of um, organic kind of stuff that protects from water on your axe mask is, is good. Um, the other thing I tend to do to protect the rest of my kit is I buy a better axe mask than comes with the axes because a lot of the axe masks are quite soft. Like the Grand's Floors axe masks, I don't think are particularly good. They're quite bendy. On, I've got one here somewhere. It's getting dark in my room. Yeah, so like that's really quite flexible on the corners. And I and what I've seen quite a lot happen is traveling 
is that this, even when you try and protect this in luggage and in packs, that will get bent over at some point and it immediately starts, the, the, the corner of the ax bit is putting pressure on the inside there. And over time it gets worn, this all gets soft. These, these um, straps are really long and I've seen those stretch a bit in the past as well. So not that they're really bad, but I think it's the worst part of the ax. Like the handle is good quality typically, the head's very good quality, the, the least good quality piece that comes with it is the mask and there are some really good aftermarket ones and there's plenty of kind of cottage industry makers who make really good you know more saddlery kind of quality leather like these ones that's really stiff and solid and um, that just helps protect the rest of your gear from your axe better than the one that it comes with so um that's something i do better mask, make sure it's well treated with leather, oil on the head. And then the, the, the finishes that come on the axes are reasonably good um, in the sense that it's linseed oil. Typically it's linseed oil mixed with a bit of beeswax. Sometimes it's just linseed oil, but m many of the wooden handles have a bit of beeswax in as well. And that's fine. There generally isn't a very great coating on there and it can start to get quite dry. So what I do is if I if I've got the time, I'll refinish it. And that's a whole other that's a whole that's the seventh whiskey fireside chat. That's not even in my book, actually. I've got a free guide on how to do that. I've made a PDF guide. But fundamentally, if you've got a wooden axe handle, even if you just start with the factory finish, put some more boiled linseed oil on it just to give it some extra coats of protection or a, another equivalent product like the one, you know, some oil or something that's going to give it some extra water protection. Because it's not, again, atmospheric moisture, rain, it getting a bit wet in the portage pack, <clears throat> excuse me, or just sweaty hands, right? And if the coating here is not very strong, and it's not very resilient, what happens is the moisture starts getting into the wood, the wood grain will raise, so the grain in the wood will swell and you'll start getting little ridges, which is not good for your hands. You know, if you're using an ax quite a lot and it all starts getting rough, then you start getting sore hands, blisters, etc. And also it just shows the wood's not very well protected. So an oil, <laughs> not a varnish. Yeah, I, I tend not to use a varnish because var it's like, I guess it's like the paddle debate, isn't it? Um, but you know, varnish can chip. And once you chip the varnish, you have to kind of build it up again. Whereas I tend to use linseed oil on mine and I use boiled linseed oil, which does have some additives in it, a bit like paint, but it dries quickly enough that you can build up a, a number of coats. The problem with raw linseed oil, particularly on a tool handle, is it takes a very long time to dry. It can dry, and even when it does kind of go a bit more cured, it can still be sticky which isn't great. So you want something that's going to dry off quite quickly. So the boiled linseed oil, as it's called, is, is the best, in my opinion. You can mix beeswax with it. Um, I don't do that, but that is something that traditionally was done, as I say. I just build up a... I, if I want to build up a brand new finish, I take it back to the raw wood. I do a bit of work on the grain, get it really smooth, and then I build the, the finish up. But if I just start with a factory finish, I just put boiled linseed oil on, put quite a slather on with a small paintbrush, wipe off the excess. I tend to do that with disposable paper towel because if people don't realize linseed oil in rags creates, it, it, you get an exothermic reaction as the linseed oil um, oxidizes and that can set fire to the rags. And if that's in your shop or your shed or your cabin, then you've got a fire on your hands and plenty of workshops and garages have gone up in flames as a result of people not knowing that in the past. So that's something people should be aware of. Just use some paper towel and then and then burn it afterwards rather than you know leaving it soaking in the garage to set fire to the rest of your property. So, but wipe off the excess, let it dry, and then put another coat on the next day, wipe off the excess, let it dry. And you can build up quite a resilient coating over, you know, I would do that every day for a week and then maybe a couple of times over the next month and then you're going to have a decent additional finish just on top of the factory finish okay next chapter of uh, felling limbing and sectioning uh trees so basically yeah if you're going to fell a tree a good point that there's a tree that's uh overhanging your your tent spot 
so using an axe and a saw so do you do the saw cut first and then axe it or do you axe it and do the saw cut so um first thing to say is i keep what i teach with tree felling very very simple because again there's a whole area of expertise there and one of the things i tell my students is just keep it super simple right we're not forest we're not having to chop every forest every tree down in the forest or hit a quota or you know th there's a specific reason why we're probably going to have to do that and sometimes it might be firewood in the winter um other times it might be some things um in the way um and i mean that in a safety sense not from a you know we shouldn't just be lopping trees down because you don't like where they are and um, back to the ethics thing right um, or it could be you're in some woodland where you've got permission. It could be your own land. It could be land that you've got permission, um, like where we run courses, for example. And um, it's a, it, there is some management that goes on in the woodland, and, and we we excuse me fit into that, and we do harvest some of the the materials there. But it's within the management of the forest there. So most of the stuff that we're felling there is is a renewable resource that's part of the you know, it's a sweet chestnut coppice. And so, you know, there are some reasons why you might want to be doing it, whether it's relatively close to home or further afield. Um, but either way, whether you're felling dead standing stuff or green, and there's a lot more weight in green wood than there is in dead standing. And that's the first thing for people to realize, keep it simple. So if anything's got a horrible lean on it, or it's on a really steep slope or what have you, and you're not very experienced, just just leave it alone because the, the, the force is in there it's more complex right and then so you want something that's relatively straight straight up and down and then you want to look at what's the shape of the trunk you know if it's if you need it to fall that way and it's leaning that way a little bit then that's not good but it could be relatively straight at the bottom but then it might bow back but that means the weight is off center so again you want to be suspicious about it going the way you want it to and then where where are the branches does it have you know evenly distributed branches so you want to think about all of those things first before you even start cutting anything you know is it appropriate do i need to do this do i have permission all of those things first then to be honest with you it's one of the most dangerous things you can do with an axe is take a sizable tree down right so you don't want to be doing it unless there's a good reason for doing it but if you do want to do it it's safer to use a saw and an axe in combination than just use an axe. So, you know, you've got this traditional view of a lumberjack perhaps with a, just doing everything with an axe and you can do everything with an axe, but typically what you're doing at the front of the tree, and by the front, I mean the side that is gonna to fall towards, you're gonna to take out some sort of gob cut, some sort of front cut. Um, and there's, there's a few very, you know, the traditional view was to take out a reasonable gob cut, the chainsaw, um, people will take out a smaller cut these days because they're using a saw and they've they've got different there's a different dynamic to that in the sense of the tool fitting in the in the space that you're cutting into and all of those sorts of things but you take a wedge of material out the the side of the tree that it's going to fall towards and then what basically what that what what you've done is you've got a bunch of fibers and you've removed some support from one side and other things being equal it's going to it's like you standing on one leg right if you if you just lift one foot up you're going to fall over unless you adjust your balance and so what you've done is basically taken one of the feet out from under the tree and it wants to fall and so it puts all the fibers on the back other things being equal if it's relatively straight puts all the fibers under tension and yes you can then chop into that with an axe but you're twanging a lot of those elastic bands all at once right which is less controlled than going in with a saw and pinging them almost one by one. You can be a lot more controlled. Um, equally, you don't want to be sawing into the tree with the with the with a with a bow saw, because again, if that gets pinched, you're not getting it out of there. And then trying to hack it out with an axe is horrible. And so you want to open up a cut with your axe, and then you want to be sawing with your saw. And that shouldn't get pinched at the back if you've got it right, because the tree's going to want to fall away from that. Um, Sometimes it doesn't work like that, but then that's when you've got it wrong and you don't want to be doing it on a windy day either because that's even a light breeze is enough to, you know, start moving things around. So, yeah, you got your tree, remove that side a little bit, 
no more than half, probably a little bit less, depending on the size of the tree. And then you can very controlled cut. But then where you put the cut is also important because you don't want the tree sliding back off the stump, um, particularly when you're there. So you want to create a little bit of a step. So that you've got your front cut, the bottom of your front cut, your saw cut wants to be above that. So you end up with a step. So as the tree falls, it's got something to push against. Um, and then you also need to be very careful about you being behind the tree because you can still get a barber's chair, which is where it splits all the way up and that'll take your head off. Right. So you, you start to you start to cut in rather than it going there. It splits up and then goes there. You've got all that tree flips back. So you never really want either because of kickback or barber's chair. You don't want to be behind the tree. You don't want to be in front of the tree. You want to be escaping kind of at 45 degrees perhaps so you need those escape routes clear and you need to know where you're going and but you can cut very gently and carefully and in a more controlled way with the saw than you can just by hitting the back of those fibers with an axe so to me that's if you're going to have to take a tree down with just those tools that you've got that's the safest way of doing it you mentioned the book when you actually take the limbs off a tree do you start at the base on the way up or on the top on the way down it depends on what type of tree it is. So if you, if you, with, with an ax for me, um, if it's decid most deciduous trees, the branches go up, not all, the up or out. Right. And, and a lot of things like spruce, you know, the evergreen needle trees, they tend to be like that. Right. And that's partly because they shed snow and all those things. But as an observation, it's just that a lot, some trees do this and some trees do that. And, Whichever way they do, it's easier generally to attack from the more open angle than it is from the more closed angle, with, particularly with the axe. And so um, if they're predominantly going that way, I start from the bottom. And if they're predominantly going that way, I start from the top. That's okay. All right. Really important. You actually have the last two chapters. You talk about carving techniques, projects, uh, how to make a wooden spoon, all these things. And also woodland uh, campcraft. Podcast. Yeah, I mean we've yeah. we've talked to, we've talked a lot about axe skills, and it it you know it is called wilderness axe skills, but it's also called and campcraft, right? And so, you know, I I actually wanted the word woodcraft in the title of this originally, but apparently, even though you've got Bernard Mason and Ernest Thompson Seton and the woodcraft movement in North America. Apparently, particularly in the United States now, people don't associate the word woodcraft with that style of outdoorsmanship. It's outdoors personship, however you want to call it, that traditional kind of woodcraft stuff. Even though there's I've got a shelf full of books that have got woodcraft and camping. You know, there's a, there's about half a dozen books that are just called woodcraft and camping, camping and woodcraft, camping. You know, they're, they're all the same title by different people. Um, apparently now that. People think of it more as kind of cabinet making and DIY type woodcraft. So, um, but it is in that kind of woodcraft tradition in the sense that we would understand it as outdoors people that, you know, it comes from that woodcraft movement. So it's making pot hangers, making cooking rigs. And that and some of that stuff goes back to, you know, those voyageur rigs that you see in Paul Kane sketches and all of those sorts of things. There's a rich history there. And I've tried to distill down, again, some things that I find particularly useful, both in the sense that they just work and you can generally find the materials to do it. There are some more esoteric things that you can do, but there may be more material specific. And so what I try to do is share techniques that, from my experience, you know, I know they work in the UK, I know they work in Europe, I know they work in your neck of the woods, because they're, they're either very general techniques or the materials that you need have that widespread northern distribution uh, that you can find you know whether it's spruce or pine or birch you know we've got those you've got those they're different species but they do the same thing right so um generally applicable useful stuff that most people can make use of that's what i focused on in terms of the campcraft so yeah simple pot hangers to adjustable pot hangers to tripods to cooking cranes you know you might have a a, a fixed camp you might have a gathering you might want to cook a more elaborate meal or you might just be on an overnight camp where you want a very simple put a pot over a fire cook a meal move on and use a minimum materials that you need to move and so that's that's the kind of camp craft stuff in a nutshell there's also things like making benches so it's taking logs and splitting them out 
and making stools, making benches, just simple camp furniture. Because again, whether it's a camp, you know, a scout campground or, you know, you might have a fire pit at your cottage or you might want to make some benches to go around it. There's lots of application for that type of stuff. Um, and then in terms of all the utensils, it's nice to be able to make things. And I was explaining to my students the other week, you know, some people laugh about the spoon carving, right? And, um, you know, there's a spatula that I made last week. Yeah, so that's a nice, I, I made that for, for home, but I made it in the woods, right? So that's, that's made out of chestnut, but it's, you know, it's better than any one I bought from a store. And that didn't take me that long to make, mainly with the ax, a little bit of knife and a little bit of just a bit of abronet, which is like a sanding grid on there. Bit of walnut oil to finish it. And Bob's your uncle. So you can make really nice things with just the basic tools. That was one that I made um, a while ago. That's a bit of spalted sycamore, which is a, a species of maple that we get over here. Um, but that looks like a weird shape for an eating spoon, but that's my spoon of consistency as it's now known in my household. And I know that I need four of those spoons of coffee, of ground coffee to consistently make a good cafetiere, a good pot of coffee. So, and that's what I made it for. I made it for scooping, you know, when you get your bag of coffee, you know, scooping out rather than that, those little short plastic ones that you get, you know, from the store or that come with a plunger, it's like, I'm going to make one with a long handle so I can get in there. So what I like about making stuff is you can make stuff to your own specification. And I, I don't have it here, but I have a nice Frost River utensil roll. And I made all the utensils to go in there. And I take that on, you know, canoe trips when there's enough of us to justify. And it's just a nice thing to have. You know, they're all, it's all natural materials. It's all resilient. It all lasts well. It's, I've made it so it's easy to clean. And you can you can make stuff to your own specification really quite simply with very basic tools. And I think that's the lesson. So then if you break a thwart on your canoe, you need to make an improvised yoke or, or any, you know, anything. Once you've got some basic shaping abilities with an axe and a saw, maybe a, a knife, maybe. A, 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 a crook knife or Indian knife or a, a spoon knife, you can make all manner of things, right? So it's down to your skill level. So people laugh about the spoon and the spatula carving, but it, it's a it's a microcosm of building up the, the skill set that you can make things out of wood whenever you want to the specification that's in your head. And that's the value of it to me. Yeah, I love that section. That's fantastic. I'm glad Thank you me. added it. Uh, it's such a great book. I, 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 I was looking through it. I went, oh, man, this is a book that not only are you going to read all, but you're going to have it on your mantle and just say, look, I, I got the Paul Kirtley axe, knife, spoon, that book. And uh, I think it's fantastic. Uh, cheers you, to that, by the way. Well, coming from you, Kevin, that means a lot. And I'm, and that's, that's sincere because, you know, I, I've known your work much longer than I've known you. And I always looked at it as a great example of outdoor writing. You know, I've got some of your guides from when I first looked at doing canoe trips in Ontario. And, you know, I've got other, I've picked up other books over the years and, um, you know, to be able to be involved in one of your book projects, the, the winter camping was fantastic. And the fact that you chose my photo for the cover was a great honor, but for you to say that, you know, with, with as many books published as you have, to say that you think my book's really good, that's really something. So thank you. So uh, well, it's no surprise too. I, I, I trip with you a few times, uh, Paul, and uh, you're very much a perfectionist, which is really, really neat to watch. And uh, I've wa I've actually watched you put a pot hanger together for the morning coffee, and it's like, whoa! Everybody, just step back and watch this. It's like a work of art. <laughs> it's just fantastic. Uh, so cheers to that. But thank the you. other, um, what's your next book then? Yeah, good question. I've I do have a couple of ideas, and the, the, as I say, there was some stuff that didn't go into this book, but I don't think, I, yeah, you could expand some some elements and make a book out of that. But frankly, I would rather use that maybe in 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 other ways. So, for example, the the refinishing the handle refinishing stuff that I wrote that didn't make it into the book in the end. I've actually just put that out as a free guide. It's like a 12 page PDF and people can get that on my website. So, you know, there's a few little opportunities like that um, that I think I'll use that 
for. So one of my other big, um, I, I love axes. It's probably, I should have said this at the beginning, it's kind of my favorite tool to use. I, I love using them. I love the kind of dynamic of them. And that's been one of my things for a long time. But one of my other things I think people would recognize is um, uses of trees and plants, you know, both in terms of very practical uses, but also food and medicine. And um, I've got some ideas around that as well in terms of um, producing some material. Now, what form that takes, I, I don't know. I already have an online tree and plant course, but I, I want to do something a little bit different again uh, to what exists out there. So I don't want to say too much about it because you know how long these projects can take to gestate and find the time to do them. And, you know, people are listening and, but I've got some, I've got some thoughts again, stuff that's in my head that I want that I share with people in person when they're on my courses and when they're with me on trips, but I want to kind of get that stuff down. Um, one of the things that people say I'm very good at is being kind of clear and logical and organized about how I present things. And I'd kind of like the opportunity to present that in a, in a book format, some of those ideas. So that might be something that I could look at in the future. And who knows after that, you know, we'll see. Cheers. Right. I'm almost finished. Good right health. Too. Oh my Lord. It's a good thing. We don't have any sharp objects around us. Have you put all the masks back on? Yes. Are you sure? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have shoes on either. I'm barefooted. That's probably a really bad thing. <laughs> Cheers, Paul. Cheers, buddy. It's been a pleasure.